All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, research, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Monday, September 6th, 2021. It's Labor Day. And we are live. So I'm not doing my radio show tonight, but I wanted to come on uh, today and talk about the uh, African-American origins of Labor Day. You know, every Labor Day, they, you, have, you have Labor Day parades. You'll have mentions of Labor Day on news programs, things like that. But oftentimes the uh, African-American contributions and African-American origins regarding uh, Labor Day are not discussed. So we're going to talk uh, about that today. Hope everybody's doing well. And, you know, this history deals with Frederick Douglass. It deals with Isaac Myers and the uh, uh, colored, labor, colored, colored Labor Union. It deals with Frederick Douglass, it deals with A. Philip Randolph, and a lot of names of uh, African Americans we don't know about, okay? So if we look at some of this history, and I'm gonna refer to a PowerPoint presentation here also that I put together today. I'm gonna refer to my written notes, but I'm also gonna refer to a PowerPoint presentation here. And everybody share this broadcast on your social media platforms, invite your friends to tune in as well. We're broadcasting on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. All right, and, and my radio shows on Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight, and Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we also broadcast here on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, uh, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, but I'm on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF here in Detroit. You can download the iHeartRadio app. You can listen to our show live. Um, just search for 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. And also you can listen to audio podcasts of the African History Network show through iHeartRadio as well. So what is Labor Day? Okay. What is Labor Day? Um, Labor Day 2021 falls on Monday, uh, September 6th. And Labor Day pays tribute to the contributions and achievements of American workers and it's traditionally observed on the first Monday in September, traditionally observed on the first Monday in September. Uh, and then it also serves as the unofficial end of summer as well. But it was created by the labor movement in the late 19, uh, 19th century, late 1800s, and became a federal holiday in 1894. OK, it was President Grover Cleveland that uh, signed it into law. Uh, signed uh, Labor Day into law as a way as a way to appease the labor movement during a, a huge strike that was taking place. Place we're going to talk about that also, and this deals with the history of the Pullman Porters and George Pullman, who founded uh, uh, the Pullman Car Company. He also founded Pull Pullman, Illinois, as well. This is a this is a very very deep history. Okay, so. Um, we see it, uh, the official ho the, uh, federal holiday goes back to 1894. And Labor Day weekend also symbolizes the end of summer for uh, many Americans. And we know a lot of school children go back to school after uh, Labor Day. And Labor Day is often celebrated with parties, street parades, and athletic events as well. All right, now let's continue here. So the, uh, and I'm gonna refer to my uh, notes here uh, as well, because this deals with a lot of history also. Now the labor movement fought for fair wages and to improve uh, working conditions, and to improve uh, working conditions as is well known, but it was the political efforts that, that uh, did nothing less than transform uh, American society, okay? Uh, organized labor was critical in the fight against child labor and 
uh, organized labor was critical in fighting for the eight hour work week. All right. And, and you know, a lot of things that we uh, enjoy today when it comes to labor, um, a lot of times people just take those for granted or maybe think it was always like that and don't understand the history, the fight that took place to get things like the, the eight hour work week or to get child labor laws, et cetera. All right. Um, and then also we see labor involved in the fight for the new deal and new deal policies. And it's the new deal uh, during World War II under President Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt that's going to give us uh, the Social Security Administration, the Social, Social Security Act of 1935 uh, is going to give us unemployment insurance. Uh, it's under the New Deal also that you get the Minimum Wage Act of 1935 as well. OK, so uh, union workers sacrificed in America's uh, historic production. And this let me let's change this here. OK. Um, union workers sacrificed in America's uh, historic production effort in World War II and pushed for great society legislation in the 1960s, okay? Great society programs under uh, uh, President uh, Lyndon uh, Baines Johnson. Um, now, Michael Patrick, a former local machinist, president uh, from uh, Galesburg, Illinois, uh, cites his union's support for Medicare and the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, as among his local union's proudest moments. Now, though uh, those shared victories came at a cost, however, those shared victories came at a cost. Agitation for antitrust legislation, uh, shorter work days and work weeks, and the right to organize was often portrayed as being un-American often portrayed as being un-American and violently repressed. In 1914, John Kirby, who was the president of the National Association of Manufacturer, Manufacturers, called the trade union movement, quote, an un-American, illegal, and infamous conspiracy. An un-American, illegal, and infamous conspiracy. And let me increase, let's see here, let me adjust that. All right. All right, now. Now, anti-labor uh, anti -labor employers fought against what they saw as incipient communism with strike-breaking, blacklisting, vigilante violence, and by enlisting government force to their side. So a lot of people that were involved in the labor movement and fighting for better wages and trying to unionize and things like this, they get labeled as communists, okay? They get labeled as communists and get labeled as anti-American. Now, during the Red Scare of about 1919 to 1921, many states passed blanket sedition laws against radical speech and banned the flying of the red flag. Now, when we look at the uh, Red Scare, okay, just some, some brief information here dealing with the Red Scare. This was linking many American workers fighting for fair wages and things like this, linking them to communism and linking them to Russia. Now, the Red Scare was hysteria over the perceived threat by communists in the U.S. during the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States, which intensified in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Communists were often referred to as Reds for their allegiance to the red Soviet flag. Now the Red Scare led to a range of actions that had a profound and enduring effect on US government and society. Federal employees were analyzed uh, to determine whether they were sufficiently loyal to the U.S. government and the U.S. Un-American Activities Committee, the U.S., the, the, the House, the House of Representatives Un-American Activities Committee, committee, as well as U.S. Senator Joseph R. McCarthy 
investigated allegations of subversive elements in the government and the Hollywood film industry. All right. Now, uh, the climate of fear and repression linked to the Red Scare finally began to ease in the late 1950s. But we're going to see this also in uh, 1919, 19, 19, 19, 19, 20, 19, Now, here's a picture of Senator uh, Joseph McCarthy, Republican of Wisconsin. He was a senator from Wisconsin from 1947 to 1957. Okay. All right. Now, the first Red Scare goes back to 1917. Okay. During World War I. World War I is 1914 to 1918. The first Red Scare occurred in the wake of World War I. The Russian Revolution, the 1917s, saw the Bolsheviks, uh, led by Vladimir Lenin, topple the Romanov dynasty, kicking off the rise of the Communist Party and inspiring international fear of Bolsheviks and anarchists. In the United States, labor strikes were on the rise and the press sensationalized these labor strikes as being caused by immigrants bent on bringing down the American way of life. OK, immigrants who were here and working in unsafe conditions and things like this, oftentimes they get they get blamed for bringing down the American way of life. Uh, the Sedition Act of 1918 targeted people who criticized the government monit monitoring radicals and labor union leaders with the threat of deportation. OK, you can read more information about the Red Scare at History.com. History.com is official website of the History Channel, and they take you through different phases of the Red Scare through the 19, uh, 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 1917, 1920, 21, then through the 1940s and 50s. OK, now, Labor Day began not as a national holiday, but in the streets when on September 5th, 1882, uh, thousands of bricklayers, printers, blacksmiths, railroad men, cigar makers, and other and others took a day off and marched in New York City. All right. Um, and let me go back. Let me see something. Let me go back. Okay. Yeah, I'm on the right slide. Okay. Um, so Labor Day began not as a national holiday, but in the streets. Uh, when on September 5th, 1882, thousands of bricklayers, printers, blacksmiths, railroad men, cigar makers, and others took a day off and marched to New York City. They were saying things like eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what we will, read one sign. Another sign said, labor creates all wealth. Labor creates all wealth. Now a placard in the uh, following year's parade read, we must crush the monopolies lest they crush us. We must crush the monopolies lest, lest they crush us. Now, the movement for the holiday grew city by city. Move, movement for Labor Day holiday grew city by city. And eventually, the state and federal authorities made it official. Okay. Uh, Theatlantic.com has a really good article uh, dealing with uh, Labor Day's origins called When Labor Day Meant Something. When Labor Day Meant Something. Now, also very quickly here, anytime I speak, you know, I may say some things outside the circumference of some people's awareness. So um, just because I say something that uh, people disagree with or what have you does not mean that what I'm saying is not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. I'm, what I'm saying may be outside the circumference of your own awareness. Okay. Uh, usually how people put their fingers together to form a circle. I usually say something like this. The space inside the circle represents my realm of knowledge. Everything that I think I know about whatever I think I know is represented within the circumference of the circle. I must keep in mind that there are still things to know that exist outside the circumference of my own awareness. All right. So just because you know everything that you know about what you know does not mean you know everything there is to know about what you know. There's still things that exist outside the circumference of your own awareness. And I learned this from one of my teachers, Dr. Ray Hagens, also. All right, from the African village. Okay. 
Uh, share this broadcasting on social media platforms. Be sure to follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Also, turn on uh, live notifications so you know when we go live. If you like this type of information, you can also support us. Dollar sign The AHN Show through Cash App. Dollar sign The AHN Show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash The AHN Show, because we're here six days a week. I broadcast our radio show six days a week, and uh, this helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. For Sunday night, my show is on Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight, and um, the radio station was giving everybody else the day off, but uh, so I took the day off also. So I'll be back live on the air Tuesday, uh, you know, back on the air live Tuesday. All right, let's continue here. So why do we celebrate Labor Day? Why do we celebrate Labor Day? Now, for some people, Labor Day is just a, a, a day off from work. Uh, for some people, Labor Day is the last day off before children go back to school or the last time they could take a vacation, the last day of vacation, what have you. But Labor Day is, is something much more significant than that. Now, Labor Day, an annual celebration of workers and their achievements, originated during one of American labor history's most dismal chapters. Okay. And this ties into the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution also has connections to slavery, especially in Great Britain, because the Industrial Revolution is going to start in England in the 1790s. Now, in the late 1800s, at the height of the Industrial, industrial Revolution, the United States, in, in the United States, the average American worked 12 hour days. OK, in the late 1800s. The average American worked 12 hour days and seven days a week in order to scratch out a basic living. Despite restrictions in some states, children as young as five years old or six years old worked in meals, worked in factories and mines across the country. And they were earning a fraction of what the adults were earning. OK, now people of all ages, particularly the very poor and recent immigrants coming to this country often faced extremely unsafe working conditions with insufficient access to fresh air, sanitary facilities, and taking breaks, bathroom breaks, lunch breaks, etc. cetera. Um, so when we look at the Industrial Revolution, okay, the Industrial Revolution marked a period of development in the latter half of the 18th century, latter half of the 1700s, that transformed largely rural agrarian societies in Europe, especially in England. This is going to start in England and um, and America into industrialized urban uh, areas. Now, goods that had once been painstakingly crafted by hand started to be produced in mass quantities by machines in factories. Thanks to the introduction of new machines and techniques in textiles, iron making, and other industries. So because of technological advancements, okay, we're going to see uh, uh, mass production of, of products. We're gonna see mass production of products. And also because of the Atlantic slave trade, the European nations, especially England, are going to be able to find an almost endless amount of raw materials, an almost endless amount of raw materials, especially in Africa. OK, uh, so this is all going to contribute to this. Then and then also in 1790, right, right around 1793, Eli Whitney events the cotton gin. The cotton gin makes it easier to pick the seeds out of cotton, which increases the production, it, it, which increases the need for cotton, lowers the labor cost of cotton and creates a big demand for cotton as well, which then creates a greater demand for enslaved Africans. All right. Now, there was a piece uh, from this is from the BBC. Uh, I'm going to go to this here in just a second. Uh, this is a uh, slave trade and the British economy. Uh, this is a, a, a good 
piece from the BBC that gives a good synopsis here. Hold on, let me pull this up here. Just a second. I have it up in Firefox, but I can't find it. I have about 100 tabs open in Firefox, literally. And then I'm in Google Chrome right now, but I can't find it. So let's look at this here. Uh, we're going to go to, this is slide three, I think it is. Let's see, trade the British economy. Okay, well, let's look at this. This takes us to the beginning. It has some different slides here. We'll look at the first slide because all, all, the, the, all this history is connected. All this history is connected here, okay? Um, okay, we'll come back to this. Fueled, uh, fueled by the game-changing use of steam power, the Industrial Revolution began in Britain and spread to the rest of the world, including the United States by the 1830s and 40s. Now, it starts in the 1790s in England, okay? Modern historians often refer to this period as the first industrial revolution to set it apart from a second period of industrialization that took place from the late 19th uh, century to the early 20th centuries and saw rapid advances in the steel, electric and automobile industries. So what's taking place because of advancements in technology, because of being able to mass produce products, because of having a uh, greater access to an almost endless amount of raw materials this uh creates the industrial revolution and then in these factories that are being built and more and more factories being built you need people in the factories so and and you have a shift from the agricultural uh based economy to a more industrial based economy so then as these people are going into these factories there's a lack of laws there's a lack of laws to protect them. There's a lack of laws dealing with when they could take breaks and how long they have to work and things like this. Then you see a need for them to have organized labor to fight on behalf of the workers. All right, now, if we look at this here, okay. Uh, more efficient mechanized production meant Britain's new textile factories could meet the growing demand for cloth both at home and abroad where the nation's many overseas colonies provided a captive market for its goods in addition to textiles the british iron industry also adopted new innovations so we see these advancements in technology also we see that wool was like the dominant fabric that they're producing in england but then when cotton becomes uh king cotton is going to surpass uh the production of wool all right and you're going to need more and more cotton uh meals cotton factories things like this okay now let's look at this next slide then we're going to go to this piece here from the bbc so if we look at slavery and industrial revolution from 1750 onwards a new industry emerged in britain the production of cotton cloth wool production had previously been Britain's major industry, but cotton had one key advantage. Machinery could process cotton fibers better than wool. Machinery could process cotton fibers better than wool. And they they, they had, they were growing a lot of wool in England because you know, wool comes from sheep, all right? But the machinery could process cotton better than it could wool fiber which was another advantage for cotton. Disadvantage for us, <laughs> but it's another advantage for cotton. Now, as a result, it was in cotton production that the, industri that the industrial revolution began, particularly in and around Manchester, England. The cotton used was mostly imported from slave plantations. The cotton used was mostly imported from slave plantations. The cotton used was mostly imported from slave plantations, which shows the foundation of this industrial revolution going to slavery and slave labor. Slavery provided the raw material for industrial change and growth. OK, so we're, I'm going to look at this next piece here. This is from uh, the BBC. 
and this this deals with uh slave trade and the british economy slave trade and the british economy and this is the piece that some of this information comes from okay the slave trade in the british economy take a look at this just one second i'll be right back take a look at this All right. So if we look at this here, this is um, page one. Uh, I'm going to focus in on page three, but we'll look at the information here on uh, page one. OK, how's everybody doing? All right. Let's see here. Um, so. If we look at uh, look at the history of slavery in terms of its horrific impact uh, in the 18th and 19th century, uh, financial considerations dominated the interests of those involved in the slave trade. Uh, African slaves were seen as property and their experience as human beings was really not considered. To understand the extent to which Britain has been shaped by the uh, transatlantic slave trade it is important to consider the scale and breadth of slavery's impact on the British economy. So just briefly here, because I want to focus in on page and I have a lot of information to get to get through. Uh, so uh, they go break this down by year. 1700, 80 percent of British exports uh, go to Europe. 1700. OK, they're going. OK, Brit, uh, uh, Bristol, uh, Liverpool, Glasgow are small ports. 80% uh, of British exports go to Europe. 1711 South Sea Company is set up. Uh, okay, 1711 goes 1733. Molasses, uh, acts, Molasses Act bans import of foreign sugar to North America. Uh, 1750, cotton production emerges as major uh, British industry. 1760, 1760, Glasgow becomes main uh uk uh tobacco importer now slavery is going on here because they haven't uh england's going to abolish the international transatlantic slave trade in 1807 england enters in the treaties uh with other european nations they're, they're going to abolish the international trans transatlantic slave trade but they're going to allow slavery to continue in the british territories the u.s abolishes the international transatlantic slave trade in 1808 january 1st 1808 it goes into effect. It passed the uh, it passed Congress March 2nd, 1807. OK, and that's stipulated by. Uh, that's stipulated by the U.S. Constitution. Um, Article one, section nine, clause one of the U.S. Constitution that put a 20 year clause uh, in the U.S. Constitution stating, stating that the earliest that the international transatlantic slave trade could be. Uh, abolished would be 1808. So if you read, if you go to congress.gov or, well, actually, if you go to loc.gov, Library of Congress website, and if you go to congress. if you go to archives.gov and you uh, look at the U.S. Constitution and you go to Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1, it uh, basically it talks about how the earliest that the international transatlantic slave trade can be abolished is 1808 and that means bringing africans into this country to enslave them now that does not now when that went into effect in 1808 it made it illegal to bring africans into the country to enslave them but you could still have african slaves in the country you can still have auctions things like this this was dealing with actually bringing them into the country that was illegal okay 
And the um, for more information on this, you go to it was a ton of information, but you can go to history.gov uh official website of the history channel and uh search for march 2nd 1807 congress abolishes the african slave trade march 2nd 1807 uh, politico.com i've done an entire lecture dealing with the history of the amistad slave ship this ties this ties into the amistad slave ship in the u.s supreme court case of 1841 dealing with the amistad that you see dramatized in the uh movie uh, Amistad from about 1997, uh, okay, with uh, Morgan Freeman and uh, Jamon Hansu, okay, and and they win their freedom in uh, those Africans on the Amistad slave ship. They win their freedom in you in the U.S. Supreme Court. That's a landmark U.S. Supreme Court case. If you go to uh, Congress. If you go to um, Archives.gov, which is the National Archives. And you look up the Amistad slave ship case, okay? Uh, one, they have some of the original court documents there that you can read. Two, uh, the first thing they tell you is um, that when those Africans were captured in Sierra Leone in 1839, they tell you that it violated all the international treaties at the time, okay? And the reason why is because um, the various European nations has sat, has signed treaties to abolish the international transatlantic slave trade. Okay. And if we just look at this briefly here, because all this history is connected, some people should go read before they post here on my thread. Uh, this is at archives.gov. This is about the Amistad slave ship case, which goes to the U.S. Supreme Court. They they win their freedom in the U.S. Supreme Court because it was illegal for that ship to come into the US waters in the first place, okay? But if you go to archives.gov and just search for the Amistad case, just very briefly here, in February, 1839, Portuguese slave hunters uh, abducted a large group of Africans from Sierra Leone and shipped them to Havana, Cuba, a center for the slave trade. The abduction, th this abduction violated all of the treaties then in existence this abduction violated all of the treaties then in existence okay because european nations have signed treaties to abolish the international transatlantic slave trade now england is not going to abolish actually having slaves to 1833 and they're going to pay reparations to about forty six thousand slave owners okay the u.s uh abolishes the international transatlantic slave trade that goes into effect march 2nd 1800 well it goes into effect january 1st 1808 it passes congress march 2nd 1807 but these europeans here in this country are going to continue to, to bring africans into this country which was illegal okay which forms a legal foundation for reparations because they violated federal law they violated federal law and one of the, when the biggest u.s supreme court cases is of the amistad slave ship and they tell you that when, when you read about that court case with the Amistad, they tell you it was illegal for the ship to come into U.S. waters in the first place because the uh, international transatlantic slave trade had been abolished. OK, so if you go read this here, additional background, let's see back up here. OK, Amistad case, then they have additional background and then you could read what the uh, ruling was in this case. All right and they go through and break all this down and, and and one of the things they say is that those africans on the ship they had the right to take up arms to defend themselves because it was a mutiny on the ship okay uh the district court ruled that the case fell within federal district court ruled that the uh, that the case fell within federal jurisdiction and that the claims of the africans as property were not legitimate because they were illegally held as slaves uh the u.s district attorney filed an appeal to the supreme court so then it goes to the supreme court okay let me see here um in the trial before the supreme court the africans were represented by u.s former uh president and descendant of american revolutionaries john quincy adams sixth president of the united states after he serves as president he serves as one of their defense attorneys for the the africans uh africans on the amistad ship preparing for his appearance before the court john quincy adams requested papers from the lower courts okay we step over that 
Africans, uh, Adams passionately and eloquently defended the Africans' right to freedom on both legal and moral grounds, referring to treaties, referring to treaties prohibiting the slave trade and to the Declaration of Independence. This is a deep case. The, the, the people talking about reparations, I don't know why they don't cite this U.S. Supreme Court case. Because all the Africans that were brought into this country from January 1st, 1808 through about July 1860, when the Clotilda came into this country, all those Africans, that was illegal based upon federal law. I don't know why they, I don't know why they don't cite this. I've asked them about this, some of them about this. And, you know, they just said, I mean, you know, they just said all, you know, I said, this, this is what I asked one of them. I said, look. I'm, I'm all for reparations. I'm for making legal arguments for reparations. I said, I'm, you can have your other strategies, but this should be part of it. Don't You don't have to get rid of all that other stuff and $20 trillion. And you don't have to get rid of all that, but this should be part of it because this is a, this is a legal foundation. When you, it, can, it can be part of a legal foundation. Okay, When you go to lawmakers, lawmakers write laws. Lawmakers don't legislate morality. When you go to lawmakers, you go to Congress, you go to the House of Representatives for their hearing on reparations, things like this. You go to argue law. You don't go to argue morality. If you want to argue morality, go to church. Lawmakers write laws. And when they write laws, the, the laws can be challenged in the court of law. And if they get struck, if the law gets struck down in court, it gets struck down on the basis that it's unconstitutional, which means the foundation is the U.S. Constitution. If a, if a, if a law gets upheld in court, it gets upheld on the basis that it does not violate the U.S. Constitution. If it gets struck down in court, it gets struck down on the basis that, OK, it's unconstitutional. Which means the U.S. Constitution is the foundation. Article six, the foundation of law. Article six of the U.S. Constitution clearly tells you that the U.S. Constitution, all of the previous treaties and all of the subsequent treaties are the supreme law of the land. So when you go to argue repairing the damage for slavery reparations, you don't go arguing we didn't get paid. Because I've been studying history for 30 years and I still can't find where it says slaves are supposed to be paid. We know it was wrong. But you don't go arguing morality to lawmakers. This way, a lot of this stuff is just ass backwards. You, you, it was legal not to pay them. What we should be focusing on is what was done that was illegal. That can be the foundation of your argument because it's right there. You got a, you got a huge U.S. Supreme Court ruling of the Amistad slave ship case that backs up the argument. But, 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 we're not focused on that. Yeah, this damage of slavery should be repaid. The real damage wasn't that we didn't get paid. The real damage, I would argue, is largely what happened after slavery ended. Because we weren't given land. We had been stripped of our nationality, stripped of our history, stripped of our culture, spiritual systems, all, all that. And that was not largely put back together. The Freedmen's Bureau only lasted a few years. That ended in 1872. The Freedmen's Bureau, it was underfunded. Okay. The, you know, it did some positive things, but you, we need a Freedmen's Bureau today. The Freedmen's Bank collapsed in 1874. It's 2.9 million dollars of our deposits that was in the that was in the Freedmen's uh, Bank. We we lost that money, okay? And there was a lot of mismanagement, things like this. Frederick Douglass was putting president uh, put in charge of the Freedmen's uh, Bank. He invested thousands of his dollars of his own money to try to prop the Freedmen's Bank up. OK, and then you look at the massive land giveaways that took place after slavery ended. Um, the homestead after 1872, uh, 1860, 1862, that gave away land up until one source says 1976. Another source I saw said 1988. They gave away land for over 100 years. We largely got locked out of that land giveaway. Yeah, you're going to have a few African-Americans that get land. Overwhelmingly, we got locked out of that land giveaway. Southern homestead out of 1866 gave away about 45 million acres of land in five southern states. We largely got locked out of that land giveaway. Dawes Allotment Act of 1887 redistributed about 138 million acres of land. Two thirds of that land went to white people, Europeans. We largely got locked out of that land giveaway. Okay, so 
when you go and you study what happened after slavery and the yeah, slavery was horrible things like this but what we have to understand is laws and policies put in place after slavery ended to continue to maldistribute wealth power and resources and then jim crow era and then redlining and housing discrimination all different types of things like this a lot of those laws are still in place so when we talk about repairing the damage you also have to change the laws and policies that maldistributed wealth power and resources in the first place because if we all got a half a million dollars a day white people have it all back but this time next week and the laws and policies will still be in place that are continued to inflict harm and damage so we have to do a systems analysis when we deal with repairing the damage that's why you, that's why you get you have to have a study you need a study done one because americans are very ignorant of history a lot of white people don't even understand their history so you have to have a study done to understand the history of slavery and the damage that was done and how it was done especially after slavery ended and in the maldistribution of wealth power resources that still is taking place today okay w one of those pieces of the puzzle which is extremely important and then we're going to get back to this in just a second but all this is connected all this is connected um the study that came out september 20th september 2020 from the city group bank i did a, I did a presentation on this some of you all saw the presentation i did this deals with how over a 20-year period of time the u.s economy lost 16 trillion dollars due to racism and see what the what this what this study shows is how racism negatively impacts everybody racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race which comes out of the ideology of european white supremacy okay racism that has nothing to do with not liking people calling people racial epithets things like that okay that's bigotry that's wrong that's bigotry racism is something different that's the power structure okay politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth power and resources and the writing of laws statutes ordinances amendments and treaties their adoption interpretation and enforcement this is politics racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race which comes out of the ideology of european white supremacy for the purpose of preserving genetic white survival so if you if we look at this briefly here uh america could have been 16 trillion dollars richer if not for inequities in education housing wages and business investment between african americans and white americans over the past 20 years we're not talking about 400 years we're not talking about going back to 1865 we're not talking about 156 years ago with the end of chattel slavery we're just talking about from 20 years they're looking at from basically the year 2000 to the year 2020 america could have been 16 trillion dollars richer if not for inequities in education housing wages and business investment okay new research shows this is from citigroup bank the study released by citigroup is the latest is the latest in the body of research that attempts to quantify this is why the study is so deep it attempts to quantify the economic impact of systemic racism that a lot of white Republicans run around and some of their Negro accomplices are running around saying systemic racism doesn't exist the reason why is because they benefit from systemic racism that's why they don't want to let the cat out the bag they don't want to get this thing up invoke said give it up turn it loose they don't want to give it up and turn it loose they're making too much money off of profiting from systemic racism they don't want to level the playing field see when you've had privilege all your life equality feels like oppression they don't want to level the playing field they don't want to deal with they don't want to deal with repairing the damage that's why they that's why people like uh senator lindsey graham of kentucky attacked the four billion dollars in 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 uh, uh uh loan forgiveness in debt forgiveness for african-american farmers and native american farmers and latino farmers in the 1.9 trillion dollar american rescue plan they attacked that they called it uh reparations stuff like that but when white farmers got almost 26 billion dollars in 2020 from the trump administration and african-american farmers got like one tenth of one percent they didn't say anything about that that was fine with them because they don't have a problem with systemic racism because they benefit from it they just don't want to admit systemic racism exists 
Because if you admit, if you if Republicans came out and all admitted systemic racism exists, and they admit it is wrong, then the next question is going to be, well, what are you going to do about it? They don't want to do anything about it because they benefit from it. They profit from it. Game recognizes game. So, so, so what they do is, like Governor Ron DeSantis of, of, of Florida, what they do is they, they have to lie and say systemic racism doesn't exist, like dumbass Larry Elder, who's running for governor of California. They, so they just have to lie and say systemic racism doesn't exist. Citigroup Bank arrived at a $16 trillion figure after estimating African-American workers have lost $113 billion in potential wages over the past two decades because they could not get a college degree. One. Two, the housing market lost about $218 billion in sales because African-American applicants could not get home loans. Three, about $13 trillion in business revenue never flowed into the economy because African-American entrepreneurs could not get access to bank loans. So when you go and read this, what it shows is how even though we may get the brunt, we get the majority of the harm for racism, is showing how racism negatively impacts everybody. Because that's less money going into the economy. Now, what, what it goes on to say, which is extremely important, it says the U.S. could have five trillion dollars in gross domestic product gdp gross domestic gross domestic gross domestic product which is the total value of uh goods produced goods and services produced in the country total value of uh income also it, it, uh, of everybody in the country as well that's the gdp gross domestic product okay it's the total value of goods services and in and income of americans um, the U.S. could have $5 trillion in gross domestic product over the next five years if those gaps and others were closed today, which means changing laws and policies. This is why just cutting the check ain't going to do it. You got to change the laws and policies that inflicted harm after slavery ended and, and created these structural inequities that we keep talking about. Read the rest of this here. This is a deep, this is a deep article. The study was done by a sister, by the way, also. There was a follow-up they had, which was an interview with the uh, sister who uh, headed up the study as well. But read this. Racism has cost the U.S. $16 trillion Citigroup fines. This is from September 23rd, 2020. I'll post the link here. You can read this, okay? How's everybody doing? How y'all like this type of information? I think Lila Brown's having a good, good time. <laughs> Okay, how's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Um, invite your friends to tune in. If you like this type of information, also, I teach an online course on Saturdays um, that deals with history from uh, 1865 through 1968. Okay, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. It's a 10-week online course that I teach. We have a new class is actually going to start on September 11th, 12 noon to 2 p.m. We have a new class starting up September 11th, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we go through and uh, each class we, we go through and look at about a 10 year period of history to see what happened to us after uh, 1865. The, we look at the last year of the Civil War. We look at what leads up to the Civil War happening. We look at Juneteenth, 13th Amendment. Uh, General Robert E. Lee surrendering to General Ulysses S. Grant, April, uh, April 9th, 1865, Appoma Appomattox Courthouse. And then we go through the Reconstruction era, 1865 to 1877, okay? And look at the presidential election of 1876, Rutherford B. Hayes versus Samuel J. Tilden, and uh, why um, uh, Reconstruction ends. And then we look at the domestic terrorism that's inflicted upon us. Uh, even after Reconstruction ends as well, we look at the Jim Crow laws, um, uh, Mississippi State Convention of uh, 1890, okay, where, where they said we're here to exclude the Negro and they implement poll taxes and literacy tests because we were the African Americans were the majority of the population of Mississippi. And we're voting people in the office uh, throughout the South. There's about 2,000 african-americans who get elected uh to political office during reconstruction 
and then after reconstruction ends we're going to see a harsh crackdown and suppression of african-american voting rights 1890s 1898 grandfather clause all different types of things like this we, we go through that period we look at uh world war one 1914 to 1918 the red summer 1919 when you had over 25 major race riots in this country uh the year after world war one ends and we go through um tulsa race massacre june uh, june 1st 1921 uh koi massacre in florida 1920 redwood uh, rosewood massacre january 1923 rosewood florida when you go study the rosewood massacre they wiped after they ran all the african americans out of rosewood and took their land they wiped rosewood off the map A after the rosewood massacre of january 19 uh 1923 and there's a movie by john singleton about rosewood a lot of it was fictitious in the movie it was a good movie but a lot of this was fictitious the the character of man played by ving rames that was a fictitious character he didn't even exist so there's a lot of fictitious stuff in the movie I, I did a um a video where we did a comparison between the real history of rosewood and the actual movie it was a good movie but it the real history is totally different it ain't had no happy ending Okay, I mean, it, you know, the African Americans got out, but it, yeah, the movie, like Sylvester Carrier, played by um, uh, Don Cheadle. Sylvester Carrier didn't ride out the town on a horse. Sylvester was killed on his mama's front porch after they killed his mama, Aunt Sarah. He shot two of the deputies, they shot him and killed him. The, the, the real history was different, okay? <laughs> I understand they got to do what they got to do to make people go see the movie, but <laughs> whenever you have these movies about historical events, you have to go study the real history of the historical event. Um, but we deal with all this, and then we deal with the um, uh, World War II, the Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement, all that. Okay, so you can register for this um, ten week online course. We're going to post the link here. We have a new class starting up uh saturday september 1st i was going to start up september 4th but I, the new session but uh, i pushed it back so it's going to start up set saturday september 1st we're going to do this 12 noon to 2 p.m eastern standard time now we do the classes live all the sessions are recorded you can go back and watch them anytime even next year even after the 10-week course is over with you can go back and watch it okay just so you know all right, so you don't have to be in class live to watch. Some people are working, what have you. And then in the class, you can see me. I can't see you. So you can have your bonnet on or pajamas, what have you. I don't know the difference, okay? I won't have pajamas on, okay? I'll be dressed like I am now. But you can see me. I can't see you. So you don't have to worry about nothing like that, okay? Class is regularly $130. It's on sale $80. There's bonus lectures that you get as well, like my lecture done with Juneteenth uh that we did june 2021 two and a half hour lecture done with the history of juneteenth also there's a six uh a digital download bundle pack of uh lectures black migrations you'll get that also free as well okay so uh classes on sale 80 dollars you can register you get this uh six title bundle pack you get that included it's going to be in um digital download format okay all right so you can we posted a link here and it's at our website africanhistorynetwork.com so you can register for that class now we'll see you in class uh class starts up saturday september 11th uh 12 noon to 2 p.m eastern standard time okay let's continue here all right um i'm gonna go back to this piece here dealing with uh from the bbc okay so we have this here so this is dealing with slavery and the, the slave uh, transatlantic slave trade in the british economy um the british economy was transformed by the transatlantic slave trade in 1700 80 percent of the british trade went to uh of, of british trade went to europe from ports on the east and south coast by 1800 100 years later by 1800 60 percent of british trade went to africa and america sailing from the three main west coast ports of glasgow liverpool and bristol liverpool is where the beatles are from by the way those that are in the rock and roll okay liverpool england that's when i first learned about liverpool from about the beatles you know 
<laughs> when I started studying history, I started learning, but I, I knew about Liverpool. But that's where the Beatles are from. Okay, now ports such as London, and su ports such as London, Bristol, and Liverpool prospered as a it prospered as a direct result of involvement in the slave trade. Other parts, such as Glasgow, uh, profited from the tobacco trade. Thousands of jobs were created in Britain supplying uh, goods and services to slave traders. Thousands of jobs were created in Britain supplying goods and services to slave traders. In a period that saw Britain industrialize, profits could be made by exporting manufactured British goods to Africa and then further profits accrued from imported slave products such as sugar which became a very fast which became very fashionable with the british people and we know with sugar right sugar comes from what sugar cane sugar cane grows in warmer climates tropical climates like jamaica haiti cuba Puerto Rico, things like that, climates like that. And Jamaica was a colony of, 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 of Great Britain after they took over Jamaica from the Spanish because Jamaica was conquered by uh, uh, Christopher Columbus in 1494. Jamaica was a, a island, Jamaica, and then we know Hispaniola, right? And the, the, the western portion of Hispaniola is going to be Haiti. The French are going to take over Haiti all right they take over saint dominique and then becomes haiti and haitian revolution 1791 1803 they declared the independence january 1st 1804. um but like recently we we've heard uh haiti in the news we've heard jamaica in the news we've heard cuba in the news those are all three islands conquered by christopher columbus on behalf of the spanish crown uh uh king ferdinand and queen isabella I, I teach another 10 week course dealing with uh ancient kemet the moors and the maafa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school so uh yeah. set sunday sunday we sunday we talked about um we're in the portion of the class we dealt with uh the moors losing control of granada in Spain, January 2nd, 1492. August 3rd, 1492, the Sephardic Jews, the Sephardim being expelled. August, August 2nd, 1492. August 3rd, 1492, Columbus set and sail on his first of uh, four voyages on the Nina the Penta and the Santa Maria. And um, in uh, 1492, he's uh, going to conquer the Bahamas. Uh, 1494, he conquers uh, Jamaica. Okay. So, we see all this evolving then we, we then we're going to see the, the 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 british get involved the portuguese are the first ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade about 1441 the spanish are right behind them spain and portugal which was the iberian peninsula in 711 a.d when uh the general Tariq ibn Ziyad, the moor goes into they invade um uh the iberian peninsula defeat the vandals and the visigoths um but we're going to see the Portuguese, the first ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade, we're going to see the Spanish, the second ones involved. England is going to come later. All right. But then for about the approximately first 200 years, the Portuguese, Portuguese are going to dominate the transatlantic slave trade. But England is going to take over and hijack. It. We're going to see these fights between these different European nations who have been fighting each other for hundreds of years because they were barbarians and Germanic people before that. OK. The, the Anglos, the Saxons, the Lombards, the Jutes, the Allens, the Picts, the Franks, um, these people had been fighting each other for hundreds of years uh, before they formed themselves into nations and, and, and European powers. They, they were fighting and killing each other for hundreds of years before that. When the transatlantic slave trade happens, they're fighting and killing each other over these new lands that they're conquering, these new territories they're conquering also. All right. So um in a period that saw britain industrialized profits in a period that saw britain industrialized profits could be made by exporting manufactured goods to africa and then further profits accrued 
from imported slave products such as sugar, which comes with sugar cane, which became very fashionable with the British people. Now, the British are known for drinking tea, right? And what do they put in tea? They put sugar in tea. OK. And, and, and this was one of the criticisms I had of Meghan Markle when she married Prince Harry, May 19th, 2018, which was uh, Queen Charlotte Sophia's birthday. And uh, Queen Charlotte Sophia was of uh, African Moorish ancestry on her mother's side of the family. Queen Charlotte Sophia. And it's also Malcolm X's birthday. And I said, I, I, I don't dislike Meghan Markle, but I said she's married to a family of colonizers. And I'm not calling them colonizers because they're white. I'm calling them colonizers because 100 years ago, Great Britain had colonized one fifth of the world population. And a lot of the opulence and, and wealth that you saw displayed uh, during during her uh, 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 marriage to Prince Harry and, you know, people were all teary eyed and saying it was a beautiful wedding, all that stuff. I said, well, you know, it was built on the backs of African slaves. A lot of that wealth that you saw displayed was built on the backs of African slaves. That's why I said she married into a family of colonizers. And then look, look and see what happened. We, we you know, whoop, there it is. You know, I tried to warn her, but, you know, people saying, oh, they're in love. I said, what's love got to do with it? <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> so let's continue. So the slave trade was important in the development of the wider economy, financial, commercial, legal, and insurance in institutions all emerged to support the activities of the transatlantic slave trade. Some merchants became bankers and many new businesses were financed by profits made from slave trading. The slave trade uh, played an important role in providing British industry with access to what? What? Raw materials. Uh-oh. The slave trade play an important role in providing British industry with access to raw materials. This contributed to the increased production of manufactured goods. Oh, see the industrial revolution, which then caused the need for more human labor in factories, which then caused the need to organize human labor. So they're protected by laws that's precipitated by the transatlantic slave trade and the industrial revolution is coming about because England and other European countries, but it starts in England, the industrial revolution, they have access to raw materials because of the transatlantic slave trade. The, now the graphic below shows the parts of Britain's economy that benefited from the transatlantic slave trade. Let's look at this here. So you have industrial revolution. See, when they teach about the industrial revolution, when they talk about the industrial revolution in school, I didn't like history when I was in school. I'm gonna be honest with you. Now, when I got to college, I was, you know, I was studying Dr. John Henry Clark and Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinin, and I was listening to conscious hip hop and Malcolm X and Minister Farrakhan, things like this. So I started really studying history in college. I ain't like history in high school. Because they they weren't teaching it like when they talk about the industrial Re revolution they didn't connect it really to slavery in African people things like this okay so we see the industrial revolution London finance uh we see wealth and income uh let's see shipping down shipping exports and manufacturing industrial revolution London and finance wealth and income happy white people in 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 enslaved africans all right and then when <laughs> then when um I, I was saw this idiotic interview that candace owens did with larry elder um black conservative radio talk show host uh larry elder who doesn't have a clue and he talked about how uh if if we if we talk about giving reparations to white people then we should give rep reparations to uh slave owners here in the country here in this country because he said like it or not slavery was legal okay now he he didn't tell you that uh from 18 
08 to 1860, white people were breaking the law, federal law, and bringing Africans into this country. He didn't talk about that. Then also, it is true that the British, Candace Owens didn't know this because she's a dumb as hell. The people that follow Candace are dumber than she is. Uh, that's why she won the debate uh, Roland Martin because he, he'll tear, tear her behind up like Michael Eric Dyson did on MSNBC as well. Um, Candace Owens didn't know that Great Britain, when they abolished slavery in 1833, they paid 46,000 British slave owners reparations. They did. Here in the U.S. in 1862, the uh, e Emancipated Compensation Act of April 1862, signed by President Abraham Lincoln, paid um, slave owners only in Washington, D.C. They got reparations only in Washington, D.C., up to $300 per, per slave. That was only in Washington, D.C. But after the Civil War ends, President Andrew Johnson is going to give the confiscated land back to the plantation owners, back to the Confederacy. He's going to give the land back to them. OK, Larry Elder didn't talk about that. You know, he's a professional white behind kisser. That's that's his game. OK, I, I know I know the hustle he's running. That's his game. All right. So that's an example of how elections have consequences. OK, because he'll be a horrible governor of of uh, of uh, California. All right. And he and he's he's um, uh, he's against the mass mandates. Uh, coronavirus would just be totally out of control if Larry Elder was governor of uh, California. That's an example of how elections have, con have consequences. OK, let's see. Now, this is the one I wanted to go to. This is the slide right here. Uh, well, it's just the one. I want to go to manufacturing economic growth. Which slide is that? Just a second here. They have different slides you can look through. I'm not going to go through all these because I don't have time to go through all these. Okay, that's slave trade and British economy. I want uh, this slide. I want. I want the one dealing with slave trade. I want the one dealing with manufacturing. And let's see here. Okay. How's everybody doing? Let me pull this up. Also, if you all like this type of information, and you want to support the African History Network, we definitely uh, appreciate your support. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Okay. So we broadcast our radio show six days a week. I do a lot of research, etc. You can join us uh, Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight, Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., and uh, other broadcasts we do. And uh, this helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting as well, okay? Um, and when you, be sure that when you do it through Cash App, be sure to type in dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W, okay? And it'll, it'll say Michael and show my picture. And the reason why I say that is because... Um, some people set up some fake African History Network cash app accounts, which is not me. All right. So ours is dollar sign the AHN show. These other ones are fake African History Network cash app accounts. Uh, I already reported on the cash app. I don't know who did that. All right. OK, let me uh, I'm trying to find this other. I'm trying to find the right. Oh, this is OK. It's slide number four. This is what I want right here. They have some different slides here that you can uh, look at, but what I want is slide number four. Okay. Uh, slave trade and the British economy. British profits were made from exporting manufactured goods to Africa and importing slave products such as sugar. Ports such as Glasgow, Bristol and Liverpool prospered as a result of the slave trade. Let's scroll down. This is what I want right here. Manufacturing. This connects it to the Industrial Revolution. Economic growth and the Industrial Revolution. Economic growth and the Industrial Revolution. Now, this is from the BBC. They're telling on themselves. I appreciate them telling the truth, but they, they, dude, this is this ain't this isn't like 
in Cobra putting this information out. This isn't like the reparations coalition. This is this is the BBC that put this out. <laughs> the British Broadcaster Company. They're the ones that put this out. This is from bbc.co.uk. Okay, this ain't Dr. Greg Carr. This isn't Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Professor James Small, Professor Kaba Hiawatha the Combinate. This is the BBC putting this stuff out. <laughs> Many historians describe the Industrial Revolution as a process rather than an event. As a process rather than an event. The part that exports played can be shown as a virtuous circle. Okay. So let's look at this here. We see uh, business owners invest and look for better machines. Machines get better. They can produce more. They're more efficient. You know, investment in tech uh, uh, increases in technology, things like this, produce better machines. Machines get better. They products get cheaper exports grow industry grows business owners invest and look for better machines so you have this circle okay they're looking they're getting economies of scale they're 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 getting uh they, they buy get more raw materials get lower prices on raw materials the better machines can produce faster produce products faster etc they can produce more products they can lower the price of, of products as well because they have a lower cost so we see this cycle if we look at cotton from 1750 onwards a new industry emerged in britain the production of cotton cloth the production of cotton cloth wool cloth had previously been britain's major industry but cotton had one key advantage machinery could process cotton fibers better than wool uh, as a as a result it was in cotton production that the industrial revolution began it was in cotton production that the industrial revolution began particularly in and around manchester england now the cotton was used mostly the cotton used was mostly imported from slave plantations slavery provided the raw material for industrial change and growth the growth of the Atlantic economy was an integral part of the growth of exports. The growth of the Atlantic economy was an integral part of the growth of exports. For example, manufactured cotton cloth was exported to Africa. The Atlantic economy can be seen as the spark for the biggest change in modern economic history, or we can say the transatlantic slave trade economy the atlantic economy in the 1700s was founded on slave labor okay the well they're talking about the atlantic economy but the, the foundation is slavery the atlantic economy in the 1700s was founded on slave labor this is a, a painting here of a, a enslaved african cotton key features of the industrial revolution Okay. Um, let's look at this here. Key features of the Industrial Revolution. Introduction of factories, introduction of cotton, use of machines, increase in productivity, water and steam power, falling prices. Okay. Key, key features of the industrial revolution included products were made in factories instead of at home workers use machines instead of working by hand the machines were driven by water or steam power one worker could produce much more each day okay so production goes up one worker could produce much more each day a cotton spinner could spend 200 times as much in uh, the year 1800 compared to the year 1700. Cotton became Britain's greatest export industry. Now this is uh, inside of a cotton factory and them using the machines to spin cotton, all right? So read this here. 
This is at bbc.co.uk. Slave trade and the British economy. Okay, you can check this out. All right. Yeah, mass production. Okay. So we see the roots of the Industrial Revolution. The labor movement is connected to the Industrial Revolution. All right. Uh, okay, let's continue here. Let's go back to, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint presentation here. All right, so we talked about that. And then we have the U.S. Civil War, okay? So U.S. Civil War is 1861 to 1865. And when the Civil War ends now, it causes, especially white people in the South, to have to renegotiate with their or negotiate labor with their former slaves. The Civil War in the United States began in 1861 and decades after decades of simmering tensions between northern and southern states over slavery, states rights and westward expansion. The uh, election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 uh, calls seven southern states to secede and form the Confederate States of America. So South Carolina becomes the first state to secede from the Union December 20th, 1860. And the Civil War is going to break out April 12th, 1861 in South Carolina also. Four more states soon join. So it's going to be 11 states to form the Confederate States of America. The war between the states, as the Civil War was also known, ended in confederate surrender in 1865 uh the conflict was the costliest and deadliest war ever fought on american soil with some 620,000 of 2.5 million soldiers killed okay 620,000 soldiers um, died in the uh, u.s civil war millions more were injured and much of the south was left in ruin uh, you can read more information. History.com has a, a really good uh, section there dealing with the American Civil War. Now, um, we look at the Reconstruction Era, 1865 to 1877. Okay. Uh, for a 14-year period, the U.S. government took steps to integrate the nation's newly uh, freed African-American population into society and let's see here okay uh between 1863 and 1877 the u.s government undertook the task of integrating nearly four million formerly enslaved africans into society after the civil war bitterly divided the country over the issue of slavery a white slave holding south that had built its economy and culture on slave labor was now forced by its defeat uh in the civil war to change its economic, political, and social relations with African Americans. Okay, now, um, what we're going to see is that even though labor unions, we start seeing labor unions pop up in about the 1830s, we're going to see a lot of labor unions formed after slavery ends. And they're trying to protect jobs for white men and, and white immigrants that are here and trying to lock out, lock out African-Americans out of these jobs. All right. So after the Civil War ends, you're going to have a lot of your large labor unions founded. The National Labor Union was founded in 1866. Other labor unions like the American Federation of Labor with Samuel Gompers are founded uh, after slavery ends. They were found around in the 1870s, uh, American Federation of Labor. Um, it was the enslaved Africans who had the majority of the skills in this country. They were uh, there were at least 262 skills, trades and crafts that we had in this country from 1619 to 1865. And we were largely working for free. OK, now, if we look at this slide here, this comes from uh, this comes from the book. uh the other slaves, mechanics, artisans, and craftsmen uh, from 1978, James Newton and Ronald Lewis. They list uh, at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts in that book that we had in this country from 1619 to 1865. We did more than just pick cotton. Now, at the Charles H. Wright, Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History here in Detroit, when you go through there, 
when you go through their main uh exhibit called and still we rise and then uh you go through that exhibit and you come out on the other side and they take you through our history and they take you through like the 1800s and you see harriet tubman and frederick douglas things like this there's a big display on the wall that lists 262 skills trades and crafts that we had in this country from 1619 to 1865 okay and what happened was i saw it and they weren't numbered okay i saw it and there's a sign there that says um you can't take pictures so i went home and got a pen and pad and i went back and i spent an hour writing them down and i numbered them that's how i know it's 262 because I went, I went back, I spent an hour writing them down. And then they, they weren't numbered on the display. I went through and I numbered them. And it came up to 262. So that's where I get 262 from. Okay, so we were the engineers we were the barrel makers we we had all these skills now a lot, a lot of these skill sets we're going to bring with us from africa and some we're going to learn here we were carpenters all different types of things like this all right so we had the skills and our skill our our, our skills were as good as many white people in many cases better we were anchor makers, artists, bakers, barrel makers, bartenders, basket makers, beer makers, blacksmiths, bricklayers, brick makers, cabinet makers, cigar makers, cooks, coppersmiths, decorative furnishers, fishermen, engineers, gardeners, hemp baggers, herb doctors, horse trainers, hunters, locksmiths. This is just a few. So what's going to happen is, is that after slavery ends, we're going to largely get pushed out of these uh jobs because now we can compete for wages and the freedmen's bureau is helping us compete for rate wages and negotiate labor contracts the freedmen's bureau so let me see here i want to refer to my notes for this part here all right so there are at least three uh 262 skills trades and crafts that we had in this country from 1619 to 1865 and we were largely working for free after slavery ends we're going to see a lot of these labor unions created and they were created to protect jobs for white men to keep african americans out of these unions and they're going to uh have contracts with various industries and tell them you can only have you can only hire white men um that belong to these unions all right uh then from about 1866 to 1880 we're going to see about 12 million european immigrants coming to this country and a lot of these jobs that they got should have gone to african americans who were already here doing the work but um but the but but the other thing that we're going to see is that when these european immigrants get these jobs in these factories and white people who are already here in these factories we're going to see their labor largely exploited exploited as well they're going to be paid very low wages they're going to work in unsanitary unsanitary conditions okay so this is um an important piece of history to look at as well and we're going to see this labor movement take form fighting for better wages fighting for safer conditions fighting for eight hour work uh eight hour work days etc now i'm not against labor unions understanding the history of labor unions and how we were discriminated against i'm not against labor union i'm i'm against discrimination in labor unions i'm against racism in labor unions i'm against african-americans being discriminated as well as other people i'm against that in labor unions labor unions have their purpose when they work correctly and they're not uh discriminated against people because of race ethnicity things like this so i'm not against labor unions i'm against white supremacy and racism in labor unions you can read um 
For more information, read uh, the book, How White Folks Got So Rich, The Untold Story of American White Supremacy. From uh, uh, this, uh, read that book, um, third edition. Okay, third edition. Let's see here. All right. So if you look at the labor movement, labor union movement of the late 1800s, late 1800s. And they talk about this in the book, How White Folks Got So Rich. The story of American white supremacy. The labor union movement of the late 1800s has arguably done more to destroy African-American progress than any other known action of white people, I would say, after slavery. Yet it is almost totally invisible in African-American history. It's almost totally invisible in African-American history. The union movement was specifically designed to, one, remove African-Americans from their jobs in the skilled trades, which, and we dominated the skilled trades. Two, installing those jobs, the European immigrants who were flooding into America by the millions. Scholars attribute the rapid success of immigrant groups directly to the advantages they received through their memberships in the American trade unions. OK, read pages 37 to 38 of How White Folks Got So Rich, the untold story of American white supremacy. All right. Now, I'm against racism and discrimination. I'm against anybody being mistreated. OK. So I'm not I'm not saying, well, it's all right to mistreat them. Just don't mistreat us because we're all being manipulated by the same uh, elite. We're all being manipulated by the same one percent or two percent. What have you. All right. So I'm, I'm against racism and white supremacy. I'm against all of that, especially in labor unions. OK, let's continue here. All right. Now. This is George Pullman, founder of the Pullman Palace Car Company in Chicago in 1867. We'll come to George Pullman in just a second here. Because we see Labor Day becoming a national holiday during the Pullman, during the Pullman Car uh, Company strike. All right. 1894. Now, when we look at the origins of uh, Labor Day. Okay, so when we look at the origins of Labor Day and we look at the uh, uh, early history of labor unions, we're going to find that you're going to have a, a rise in labor unions when you have uh, uh, the Industrial Revolution. And it's. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me, I'm looking at my notes here. Let me skip over that. Now, many of the uh, many of these events that we see regarding labor and labor strikes are going to turn violent during um, the late 1800s. All right. In this country. And you're going to include things like the infamous Haymarket, uh, the Haymarket riot of 1886 in which several Chicago policemen were uh, policemen and workers were killed. Uh, others gave rise, uh, other uh, uh, labor strikes and things like this gave rise to longstanding traditions. On September 5th, 1882, uh, 10,000 workers took unpaid time off to march from City Hall to Union Square in New York City, holding the first uh, Labor Day parade in U.S. history. OK, September 5th, 1882, uh, 10,000 workers uh march from city hall to union square in new york city the idea of a working uh, uh, of a working man's holiday the idea of a working man's holiday celebrated on the first monday in september caught on in other industrial centers across the country and many states passed legislation recognizing it Congress would not legalize the holiday until 12 years later in 1894, 
when a watershed moment in American labor history brought workers brought workers rights squarely into the public view. And this deals with um, the uh, Pullman strike in George Pullman in Chicago. Okay, let's see here. So on March, on, on, sorry, on May 11th, 1894, May 11th, 1894, employees of the Pullman Palace Car Company in Chicago went on strike to protest wage cuts and the firing of union representatives. The Pullman Palace Car Company was named after George Pullman. So the Pullman Palace Car Company was named after George Pullman. And the Pullman Palace Car Company in, in, in Chicago, uh, the workers are going to go on strike to protest wage cuts in the firing union representatives. Uh, so, and this was during the economic downturn, okay, that uh, starts in 1893. And because of this economic downturn in 1893, George Pullman had to cut wages of his workers by 25%. And he cut union representation as well. This is going to cause a backlash, okay, amongst his workers. Now, African Americans who were basically Pullman porters on the uh, Pullman um, uh, cars on railroads, African Americans were not allowed to join the white union and they were not allowed to strike. Okay. Because they were not allowed to join the white union. They also had, a, a, and the African-American Pullman porters had another set of grievances, which dealt with the mistreatment that they suffered uh, and racism. Okay. So we're going to see uh, the Pullman Palace Car Company, those, those white workers are going to go on strike May 11th, 1894. And this is going to begin unrest in uh, the Illinois town that George Pullman founded called Pullman, Illinois. Pullman, Illinois. All right. He founded a town. He founded a bank in that town. And a lot of his workers lived in the town that he founded and they lived in property and houses that he owned. OK, George Pullman. OK, this man, I was researching about George Pullman a few years ago. And I'm like. It just blew my mind. OK. <laughs> now, George Pullman was born in 1831, in upstate New York, to the son of a carpet to the son of a carpenter. He learned carpentry him, himself and moved to Chicago, Illinois in the late 1850s. All right. During the Civil War, 1861 to 1865, George Pullman began building a new kind of railroad passenger car. OK, during the uh, during the Civil War, he began building a new kind of railroad passenger car, which had uh, berths for uh, passengers to sleep. Pullman, uh, Pullman's cars became popular with the railroads, and in 1867, he formed the Pullman Palace Car Company. Okay, the Pullman Palace Car Company in uh, 1867. Now, he was the creator of the railroad sleeping car, and the town that he founded, uh, uh, Pullman, Illinois, was just outside of Chicago. And this town had been built as a utopian home for George Pullman's workers. But the utopia was designed to serve George Pullman above all others. OK. Uh, and that was reported by PBS, Public Broadcasting System. They have information there on uh, George Pullman and, and the Pullman Porters. 
Now, PBS notes its resident, it, it, its residents all worked for the Pullman Company. Their paychecks drawn from Pullman Bank and their rent sent to George Pullman deducted automatically from their weekly paychecks. So what's going to happen is that um, because of the uh, downturn in the economy in 1893, George Pullman uh, had to cut back on wages, but he didn't cut back on the rent he was charging people. Now, from 1880 to 1893, all seemed well in Pullman town until an economic depression prompted George Pullman to cut wages. Even though their rents remained the same, the workers walked out. In solidarity, members of the American Railway Union, okay, founded by fiery socialist Eugene Debs, took up the cause and it's 100 and the 150,000 members of the American Railway Union refer refused to work on trains carrying Pullman cars, Pullman sleeping cars. This prompted a nationwide transportation nightmare. So you're going to have George Pullman who cuts wages, doesn't cut rent. Despite growing tensions among his workers, George Pullman's vision of a paternalistic community organized around a factory fascinated the American public for a time. When Chicago hosted the Columbian Exposition, the World's Fair of 1893, international visitors flocked to see uh, the model. They flocked to see the model. The model town created by George Pullman. Things changed dramatically with the Panic of 1893. The Panic of 1893 was a severe financial depression that affected the American economy. George Pullman cut the wages of workers by one third, but he refused to lower the rents in the company housing. Okay, but he cut wages by one by one third. So the so the depression set off by the pandemic in 1893 was the greatest depression america had known at the time and was only surpassed by the great depression of the 1930s in early may 1893 the new the new york stock market dropped sharply and in uh late uh june 1893 panic selling caused the stock market to crash a severe credit crisis resulted and more than 16,000 businesses had failed by the end of 1893 more than 16,000 businesses in the U.S. have failed by the end of 1893. Included in the failed businesses were 156 railroads and nearly 500 banks. Okay, this is the panic of 1893. The, the, the following year, Pullman workers are going to go on strike. Now, unemployment spread until one in six American men lost their jobs. Thought.com has a really good article dealing with the, uh, the uh, financial panics of the 19th century, and they, and they deal with the, the uh, panic of 1893. Okay, now, let's continue here. Now, this is Eugene V. Debs, and I'm halfway through my notes. This is Eugene V. Debs, president of the American Railway Union. Became president in 1893. Now, let me go back to my notes here. Okay, so he cuts wages. Um, so orders for railroad sleeping cars uh, declined and George Pullman was forced to lay off hundreds of employees. Okay, this is because of the, the, the uh, panic of 1893. Those, who were, those employees who remained endured wage cuts even while rents in Pullman, uh, uh, Pullman properties remain consistent take-home paychecks plummeted 
and so the employees walked out demanding lower rents and higher pay the american railway union led by a young eugene v debs came uh to the cause of the striking workers and railroad workers across the nation boycotted trains carrying pullman cars rioting pillaging and burning of railroad cars soon ensued mobs of non-union workers are going to join join in in response the american railway union which was the largest american union at the time with 150,000 members 150,000 members the american railway union members are going to take action the local branches of the union called for a strike at the pullman palace car company complex on may 11 1894. newspaper reports said the company was surprised by the men walking out now the pullman strike is going to spread nationwide okay and e eugene v debs was the president of the american railway union all right that's going to that's going to uh, uh join in solidarity with the uh pullman palace car company white employees not the african-american employees the white employees now outraged by the strike at his factory outraged by the strike at his factory george pullman closed the plant determined to wait out the workers george pullman's stubborn strategy might have worked except the american railway union members called on the national membership to get involved the union's national convention voted to refuse to work on any train in the country that had a pullman car which brought the nation's passenger rail service to a standstill George Pullman had no power to crush a strike which had suddenly spread far and wide the American Railway Union managed to get about 260,000 workers nationwide to join in this boycott in this labor strike at times Eugene V Debs the leader of the American Railway Union was portrayed by the by the by the press by the newspapers as a dangerous radical leading an insurrection against the american way of life because he was a socialist also now the strike instantly became a national issue and let's see here let's change this okay So the strike soon became uh, a national issue. President Grover Cleveland faced with nervous railroad executives and interrupted mail trains because the mail couldn't get delivered like it was supposed to. OK, because of the because of the strike. President Grover Cleveland declared the strike a federal crime and deployed 12,000 U.S. troops to break the strike. Violence erupted. And two men were killed when U.S. deputy marshals fired on protesters in Kensington, uh, Illinois, near Chicago. But the uh, strike, but, but the strike was doomed. On June 26, uh, 1894, the American Railroad Union, led by Eugene V. Debs, called for a boycott of all Pullman rail cars, crippling railroad traffic nationwide. To break the Pullman strike, the federal government dis uh, dispatched troops to uh, Chicago, unleashing a wave of riots that resulted in the deaths of more than a total, more than a dozen workers. So in the wake of uh, this massive unrest and in an attempt to repair ties with American workers, Congress passed an act making Labor Day a legal holiday in the District of Columbia and the territories uh, on June 28, 1894, President Grover Cleveland signed this uh, bill into law. More than a century later, the true founder of Labor Day has yet to be identified. So this, this comes about, the Labor Day being a national holiday, comes about as a way to, for uh, especially President Grover Cleveland, to try to mend ties with uh the labor movement let me see go here okay we got this and, okay so he's trying to mend ties with the labor union uh the labor movement
Now, some people credit uh, Peter J. McGuire, co-founder of the American Federation of Labor, as being the founder of Labor Day, while others have suggested that Matthew McGuire, a secretary of the Central Labor Union, uh, first proposed the holiday. Now, in an article from the Atlantic.com, um, they said that it was America's first true nationwide strike and a major milestone for the labor movement, but it did not end well for anyone. President Grover Cleveland, under pressure from the railroad industry and the U.S. Postal Service, because the U.S. Postal Service transported their mail on the railroad car, uh, railroad cars on trains, um, the, the U.S. Postal Service pleaded with him to get involved in the strike. So he declared the strike a federal crime and is going to send the the, uh, the union. It's uh, going to send the union. It's uh, sending sending the troops to end the strike. OK. According to the Atlantic, America's first true nationwide strike and a major milestone for the labor movement. OK. Um, while the strike came to an abrupt end, George Pullman's employees promised never again to unionize. President Grover Cleveland's uh, popularity suffered, especially among the labor movement's working class core. Making Labor Day a national holiday was the president's election year attempt at an olive branch, uh, as reported by PBS.org, public broadcasting system although it did not it did not succeed in winning him another term in office over time however as tensions eased between unions and the establishment the holiday came to have less to do with labor leaders than with retail figures so over the years the significance of labor day and its origins have largely been forgotten and it's been more commercialized and focused on Labor Day sales at retailers and cookouts and vacations and things like this. There's an article from Time magazine called How a Bloody Railroad Strike Paved the Way for the First Labor Day. How a Bloody Railroad Strike Paved the Way for the First Labor Day. That's from uh, Time magazine, time.com. Um, let's see here. Now, when we look at Pullman porters, and these are largely African Americans who are going to uh, service people on George Pullman sleeping cars. In their home neighborhoods, to be a Pullman porter was considered to be a prestigious position. The uh, job offered a steady income and an opportunity to travel across America and a life largely free of heavy physical labor. Rare for African-Americans in that era. Uh, historian Tamil uh, Black recounted that, quote, they were good looking. In, re in reference to pull, uh, to the uh, Pullman porters, they were good looking, clean and immaculate in their dress. Their style was quite manly. Their language was very carefully crafted so that they had a sense of intelligence about them. They were good role models for young men, end quote. Now, the, the Pullman porters were also mistreated. And this was uh, one of their grievances, but they couldn't strike back in 1894 because they weren't allowed to join the union then. Uh, they were overworked and subjected to countless indignities on the job. Uh, this is so. We see that the Pullman porters are going to organize in 1925, uh, and, and um, the first president is going to be A. Philip Randolph, president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. OK, uh, let me see. Let me pull this. Let me pull this up here. So 
Just a second, there's another picture. Okay, here we go. And there's some famous pictures of Pullman porters uh, in their uniforms that you can see online also. All right. Let's continue here. Um, so the Pullman porters were mis mistreated, underpaid, and overworked and subjected to countless indignities on the job. Quote, a Pullman porter was really kind of a glorified hotel maid and bellhop in what George Pullman called a hotel on wheels, end quote, explains uh, former Pullman porter and historian Greg Leroy. Um, the Pullman company uh, just thought of the porters as a piece of equipment, just like another button on a panel, the same as a light switch on a fan or a fan switch, he said. Now, George Pullman demanded 400 hours a month or 11,000 miles, sometimes as much as 20 hours a stretch from his Pullman porters, and he paid ridiculously low wages. In 1926, an average of eight hundred and ten dollars per year in 1926, an average of eight hundred and ten dollars per year, which is about seven thousand five hundred dollars in today's economy. Quote, it did not pay a livable wage, but they made a living with the tips they got because the salary was nothing, uh, says Lynn Hughes of the A. Philip Randolph Pullman Porter Museum. The company expected its employees to pay for their own meals supply their own uniforms and shoe polish and allow them only short naps on couches in the smoking car disgruntled pullman porters began to question their situation and decided to take on the enormously powerful company okay stand by i'll be right back All right, we're back. Let's continue. Okay, how's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in as well. How y'all like this type of information? Uh, if you like this type of information, you can uh, register for the 10-week online course that I teach on Saturdays. We have a new session of this online course starting up Saturday. It's going to be September 11th, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. This is a 10 week online course that I teach. We deal with a little more than 100 years of history. We deal with history after, uh, with the, starting with the last year of the Civil War. And we go throughout history, each class we go through and analyze an approximately 10 year period of history to see what happened to us after slavery ends, the laws and policies put in place to put us in the predicament that uh we're in right now okay and so we better understand where do we go from here uh i do a powerpoint presentation we have uh a few of the slides uh that i'm showing here are from the actual class we'll do a powerpoint presentation we have book references articles video clips a ton of information uh, and we go through and analyze approximately a 10-year period of history each class um, we do the classes live. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch them over and over again. Okay. And uh, classes regularly, uh, classes regularly $130 is on sale, $80. As soon as you register, there's bonus content that you can start watching. 
and you'll also get a uh, in digital download format you'll get some bonus lectures from me uh, uh, one that I did dealing with the history of uh, Juneteenth it's a two and a half hour lecture I did dealing with the history of Juneteenth we did this uh, June 2016 and 2019 so you get this one here this this one here is the latest one did this June 16 2021 uh, it's a two and a half hour lecture also you'll get um, uh, uh, this bundle pack here black migration 1619 to 2019 that's a 60 dollar value so it's really close to 200 dollar value you get on sale for 80 dollars okay and uh it has six of my lectures uh black migration 16 19 and 2019 uh also you get uh th this one here dealing with um when black men dominated horse racing and we were winning the Kentucky Derbies and got pushed out of horse racing. So you get all that. Uh, so just click on uh, register here. We go back up here, click on register here. It takes you to the next page and uh, just click on enroll. And as soon as you register, you can start uh, watching uh, content. You can join us in class Saturday, September 11th, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. So even if you miss class, you can go back and watch it whenever you want to that's fine even after the 10 week course is over with uh you still have access to the class you can still watch it there's another uh 10 week uh online course that i teach this deals with thousands of years of history leading up to the transatlantic slave trade this is um ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school so we have a new session starting up on uh this is going to be uh sunday september 12th this is going to be 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time also. We'll start with class number one. All right, so you can register for that one as well. All right, let's continue here. If you'd like this type of information, also you can support us. Uh, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App or through PayPal. PayPal.me forward slash the a, forward slash the AHN show. And we have the information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com also. Okay, let's continue here. Uh, let's see here. Let me go back to this. Okay, the Pullman Porters. Let's pull this back up. All right, let's continue. Uh, I have to go back to my notes. Okay, so in nineteen twenty six, uh, an average Pullman Porter uh, earned eight hundred and ten dollars a year. That's about seven thousand five hundred dollars in today's economy. Now, uh, the company expected its employees to pay for their own meals, supply their own uniforms and shoe polish, and allowed them only to take short naps on couches in the smoking car. Disgruntled uh, Pullman Porters began to question their situation and decided to take on the enormously powerful company. In 1925, the Pullman Porters formed a union called the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. The Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. And their president was A. Philip Randolph, Asa Philip Randolph. Now, this marked the, the founding of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters in 1925, marked the beginning of a 12 year struggle for dignity between working conditions and fair pay. Its leader, the charismatic uh, African American activist A. Philip Randolph, and former, uh, and, and former porter Milton Webster, head of the Chicago Union Local, uh, their eventual triumph marked the first time in American history that an African-American union forced a powerful corporation 
to the negotiating table. It was a significant step toward, uh, it was a significant step forward for African-American equality. Now the union, now we've had some steps back. We had a lot of steps that pushed us back also. The union members learned how to organize and negotiate. Cause see, we, we see the seeds of the modern day civil rights movement in the formation of the Brotherhood of Sleeping, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters in 1925 in their 12 year fight uh, against uh, George Pullman. All right. The union members learn how to organize and how to negotiate. OK, they learn how to organize and how to negotiate. And uh, let's see, we'll come back to that in just a second here. We'll go to that in just a second. Uh, they discovered that even in a time of great prejudice in America, African-Americans could effect change if they stood together and persevered. They would later apply their techniques to the modern day civil rights movement. We know that A. Philip Randolph is going to become instrumental in the civil rights movement. And he was looked at as one of the big six, uh, uh, big six ne Negro leaders. Uh, also, so the union members of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters are going to take these skills that they learned and use them in the civil rights movement to help African-Americans in general. All right, let's see here. Um, okay, let's look at this here. Uh, Britannica.com has some information on Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Uh, Blackpass.org does also, but this is uh, a quick excerpt from Britannica.com. Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, also called Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and Maids, uh, was the first African-American labor union to be affiliated with the American Federation of Labor. Founded in 1925 by a uh, labor organizer and civil rights activist, A. Philip Randolph, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters aimed to improve the working conditions and treatment of African-American railroad porters and maids employed by the Pullman Company, George Pullman's company, a manufacturer and operator of railroad cars. Railroad cars. The BSCP, uh, embodied a philip randolph's belief that segregation and racism were linked uh to the unfair distribution of wealth and power that condemned tens of millions of african americans and white americans to chronic misery uh so check this out at uh, britannica.com okay uh, uh brotherhood of sleeping car porters now let's see here And this is, um, we talked about this. This is information here from blackpass.org. Blackpass.org has a section. They have an article on uh, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters also. Talks about the mistreatment uh, of them uh, as well and uh, the strike that they went on and why they went on strike. All right, now let me look at some. Let me look at my notes here. Um, the root.com has an article from they, they had they had an article in the video clip from September 4th, 2017, the root.com called America's Racist History of Labor. America's Racist History of Labor. Now the seeds of the civil rights movement, uh we see go back to 1925, uh, in 1925 to 1930s. And black Pullman porters were not allowed to participate in the Pullman strike of 1894 led by the American Railway Union. 
Um, let me see here. Some associate African American unions. Some some associate African American unions with A. Philip Randolph and the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which was established in 1925. But some scholars date African American unions to as early as 1838. In 1869, there was the Colored National Labor Union, the Colored National Labor Union, which was established by a ship caulker named Isaac Myers, a ship caulker named Isaac Myers. OK, and he's going to become president of the Colored National Labor Union in 1869. Though the Colored National Labor Union was short lived, it paved the way for African American uh, labor unions to come. Now, Isaac Myers um, was a labor leader, a Mason, and was born in Baltimore on January 13, 1835. So he was the son of free parents, but grew up in a slave state. OK, of Maryland, uh, Isaac Myers received his education, his early education from a private day, uh, day school of a, a local clergyman named Reverend John Forty, F-O-R-T-I-E. Since the state of Maryland provided no public education for African-American children at the time, at age 16, he became an apprentice to James Jackson, a prominent African-American Baltimore ship caulker. Four years later, Isaac Myers was supervising the caulking of Clipper ships operating out of Baltimore, Maryland. During the U.S. Civil War, Isaac Myers uh, worked as a porter and shipping clerk for a grocer, uh, a, a grocery store owner, and then returned to his original profession, profession as a caulker. Soon after the war ended, Isaac Myers founded, uh, found himself unexpectedly uh, unemployed when a group of white caulkers, a group of white caulkers protested the employment of African-American caulkers and long and long uh, long shoremen. In response to the strike, Isaac Myers proposed the creation of a union of African-American caulkers. We're going to see a lot of race riots that take place throughout history are going to surround employment. And it's going to surround African is going to surround white people, white men being upset that African-Americans are being hired. OK, being hired on their jobs, being hired at their company. And this is going to cause racial tensions. All right. Here we see these uh, uh, white workers who are protesting the employment of African-American uh, workers and long and longshoremen. All right. And this is after the Civil War ends. And this is the time where you're going to see a lot, a lot of these national labor unions pop up to protect jobs for white men and lock African-Americans out of these jobs. Now, in response to the strike, Isaac Myers proposed the creation of uh, a union for African-American caucus. And uh, this is a piece here from BlackPass.org. OK, uh, let me see something here. OK, this is a piece from blackpass.org. Let's flip over to that for a second here. This is an important piece of history. And then Frederick Douglass is going to become a president of the um, colored uh, National Labor Union as well. Let me pull this up so you can see it here have it in my notes but i want to show this to you so this is uh from blackpass.org and it deals with isaac myers so the newly created colored uh the newly created union the colored caulkers trade union society decided to form a cooperative company that would own a shipyard and railroad okay a shipyard and railroad now the co-ops is basically 
the was the key to economic prosperity for African Americans. During slavery, after slavery ended, the co-ops, all right? And if you read this book here by Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard, Collective Courage, I interviewed her back in about 2014. Collective Courage deals with the history of African-American co-ops. That was the key to economic empowerment for African-Americans historically, okay? It wasn't investing in the stock market. It wasn't copying white business principles. The, the, the cooperatives were concepts that we brought with us from West Africa, and it focused on the collective. And the members of these co-ops were also owners. The, one of the most famous types of co-ops is a credit union. But we had co-ops like the Colored Merchants Association, created in 1928, the uh, Colored Farmers Union, uh, created about 1886. It grew to about 1.2 million members. It, it was founded in Texas, only lasted about five years because the, these co-ops were so successful that white people became jealous of our economic advances that we were making. Now, everybody, we still had a lot of poor African-Americans, but they became jealous of our economic advances with these co-ops and we were getting threats, we were getting killed, et cetera. So we had to disband them just to save ourselves okay uh a lot of those co-ops are going to be dismantled so some are not but a lot of those co-ops like the colored farmers union they're going to have to disband because of the threats they were getting from white people from white domestic terrorists so pooling their resources this is something that the that the co-ops did okay pulling their resources the workers issued stock and quickly raised ten thousand dollars in subscriptions among african-american baltimore residents they also borrowed another thirty thousand dollars and on february 12 1866 this is the year after slavery ends the year after the civil war ends february 12 1866 they purchased a shipyard and railway which they named the chesapeake marine railway and dry dock company the chesapeake marine railway and dry dock company within months the cooperative employed 300 african-american caulkers and received several government contracts ultimate ultimately it employed a number of white workers as well the success of isaac myers union in baltimore maryland encouraged african-american caulkers in other seaport cities to organize it also caught the attention of the national labor union executive committee then the largest labor organization in the nation now the national labor union they go back to 1866 they're created right after slavery ends and they're locking african americans out of a lot of these jobs in 1869 the national labor union invited isaac myers colored caulkers trade union society to its uh national convention meeting in philadelphia 1869 the National Labor Union declared it would welcome African-American unions to its federation. Meanwhile, uh, Isaac Myers was the elected president of the Colored National Labor Union, the first organization of its type in U.S. history. Isaac Myers appealed to uh, African-American workers to join unions and called on white unions to accept them as full members accepting the full support of the national labor union labor union he soon learned that the predominantly white organization insisted that black union members abandon the republican party and join the labor reform party okay now this is during reconstruction 1865 to 1877 like 90 95 percent of african americans are republicans because that was the party of lincoln okay expecting the full support of the national labor union isaac myers soon learned that the predominantly white organ organization insisted that african-american union members abandon the republican party and join the labor reform party this is also the party of uh, frederick douglas because douglas doesn't die to 1895 so douglas is still alive here okay when the african-american union members led by isaac myers refused to abandon the 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 republican party the gop now they get the hell out today but back then they were something they were not invited back to the national labor union 
with no allies among the, the large labor movement, the colored national labor union soon found itself isolated. It collapsed in 1870. It collapsed by 1871. Now, let's put this back up here. All right. Now, Isaac Myers held a variety of other positions, but his years of prominence were over. He's going to held a hold a number of other positions, but his years of prominence are over. He worked as a detective for the Baltimore Post Office between 1872 and 1879. Between 1879 and 1882, he operated a small Baltimore coal yard. For the next five years, he worked as a U.S. government revenue officer who inspected goods for customs duty. Isaac Myers also organized and became president of the Maryland Colored State Industrial Fair Association. The Maryland, the Maryland Colored State Industrial Fair Association. The Colored Businessmen's Association of Baltimore. The Colored Building and uh loan association and the aged uh minister's home of the ame church he also authored the mason's digest now isaac myers uh married twice and had several sons one of whom became a leading political figure in ohio isaac myers uh passed away in baltimore in 1891 okay passed away in baltimore in 1891 Um, and hold on just a second here. All right. Now we're also going to see that, uh, Frederick Douglass is going to become uh, president of the Colored National Labor Union. Um, he becomes president in 1872. Okay. I mean, sorry, president, he, there's a, there's a labor union. Let me see. Let me back up. Let's go here. There was some additional information on Douglas, but I didn't get it in here. There is a, Let me pull this up here. This this will be the last thing I hope. We'll see. How's everybody doing? I'm almost done. This is a lot of work. It took me longer to put all this stuff together than it than it did for me to. Uh, um, I most of my notes I had going back to 2018 and everything, but I updated it today and put together this PowerPoint presentation. So just bear with me. I'm almost done. Hold on. Um, there's some information I had on Frederick Douglass right here. So I want to make sure I skip over this because when you study Frederick Douglass life, it's like, man, when did, when did he sleep? <laughs> All right. Hold on. Uh, he became president in president of the code nationally yeah, 1872 okay if we look at this piece here this is from uh exhibitions lib.umdedu this is from um university of maryland university of maryland and this deals with african americans rights uh a house divided African-American workers struggled against segregation. And they talk about Frederick Douglass. Um, Frederick Douglass, uh, uh, in 1872, Douglass was elected president of the 
uh, Colored National Labor Union and the publication he edited, The New National Era, became the union's official newspaper. Okay. Um, Colored National Labor Union. And let me check one other thing here. So I think it's still going to be in uh, existence after the collapse in 1871. There was also a good piece from um, news1.com as well. Hold on. There's also a piece from news1.com today dealing with um, significant African-American figures in the labor movement. Oh, yeah, and there's also a piece from archive, archives.gov that I saw as well. Okay. Uh, lastly, this piece here from news1.com is something you can check out. For, um, Douglas also helped to organize the American League of Colored Laborers as well, ALCL. Because I, I, I remember um, dealing with that, but that, I remember talking about that before. There's a piece from blackpass.org that deals with the American League of Colored Laborers. This piece here. There's a piece from blackpass.org that deals with the American League of Colored Laborers, also. And um, it deals with uh, Frederick Douglass helped organize the union in response to the difficulty of black laborers uh, had in joining white unions. Uh, on June 13, 1850, 1850, the organization assembled for its inaugural meeting. Uh, in the lecture room of Zion's church. Okay, that's uh, 1850. That that one is the American League of Colored Laborers. All right, now, lastly, there is a, uh, a good article from news1.com. You can check out, I was reading it earlier today. This deals with uh, five five black labor five black led labor unions that have paved that have paved the way for black workers okay five black five black led labor unions that have paved the way for black workers okay so check this out also at uh, news1.com And they go through and they deal with uh, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, number one. 
they talk about the colored national labor union all right uh colored national labor union in 1869 isaac myers and among the goals of the colored national labor union which represented african americans in 21 states was the issuance of farmland to poor african americans in the south government aid for education and a new non-discriminatory legislation that would help struggling african-american workers okay you had the national domestic workers union as well founded by dorothy lee bolden in 1968 the national domestic workers union of america allowed domestic workers to fight to fight for better wages an organizer in the civil rights movement and advocate for women's rights dorothy lee bolden was inspired by her own plight as a domestic worker then you have the coalition of black trade unionists the coalition of black trade unionists uh this was a nonprofit organization of african-american trade union members it was established in 1972. okay this group is also an official member of the afl uh, cio one of uh, uh the united states largest uh federation uh unions then you have the uh american league of colored laborers the american league of colored laborers some historians believe that the american league of some historians believe some historians believe that the american league of colored laborers is the um some historians believe that the american league of colored laborers was the first african-american labor union to form led by frederick Douglass. the AA aalu was created in 1850 to help skilled free craftsmen hone their abilities in the agricultural and industrial industry it also aimed to encourage african-americans to establish their own businesses the um uh african american labor the the, uh, sorry, the um, uh american league of colored labor the american league of colored labor uh often acted as a liaison between african-american workers who in, who encountered difficulty negotiating fair labor contracts with white workers and labor unions okay so check this out here this is from uh news1.com five black led labor unions that have paved the way for black workers rights this is from september 4th 2021 by uh shannon dawson okay so we'll post that link here you can read that all right so hopefully you learn something today and learn more about the african-american roots of Labor Day and the African roots of Labor Day as well, going back to enslaved Africans in uh, the Industrial Revolution, things like that. Um, be sure to register for the 10-week uh, online course that I teach uh, on Saturdays. Be sure to uh, register for the 10-week online course that I teach on Saturdays from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968 and uh it's a 10 week online course each class we go through and look at approximately a 10 year period of history and what happened after slavery ended uh click on register here it takes you to the next page page just click on enroll and we'll post a link here uh you can register for it it's regularly 130 dollars on sale 80 dollars there's bonus lectures that you get from me uh also with this so it's about a 200 dollars value you get for 80 dollars we do the classes live all the sessions are recorded you can go back and watch them over and over again and uh you still have access to the class even like next year okay so even after the class is over with you can go back and watch it anytime uh the other class that i teach we deal with thousands of years of history uh, so this class here starts up uh we have a new class starting up saturday september um 11th saturday september 11th 12 noon to 2 p.m eastern standard time class number one uh, the other class I teach is uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. And this class here, we deal with thousands of years of history and we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. OK, 
uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And you can register for that one as well. That one starts up, uh, that'll be Sunday, September 12th, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, all of my DVD lectures and digital downloads, et cetera, are, are available at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have bundle packs of my lectures and uh, other things. Uh, you know, uh, we have DVD, digital downloads. Uh, we have lectures, documentaries, et cetera. Okay. Uh, that's all available at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have a current promotion. Uh, going on right now it's going on for a few days it's running till friday we have a current promotion um get 20 percent off of um orders of a hundred dollars or more now this is this that does not include classes online classes they're already discounted but you get 20 percent off of uh orders of a hundred dollars or more use uh promo code ahn20 off 2021 ahn20 off 2021 get 20 percent off orders of a hundred dollars or more all right that's for a limited time only okay so do me a favor follow us on our facebook fan page the african history network give this video a thumbs up if you like it give this video a thumbs up follow us on our facebook fan page the african history network the african history network Follow us on our YouTube channel, uh, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Uh, turn on live notifications so you know when we go live. Um, register for the online classes as well. The, the two online courses that I teach, register for those. You can use these with your children also. You can use these classes with your children. I would say that they are PG-13, okay? I would say they're PG-13. I don't do a whole lot of cursing in the a lot of craziness in there i'm not people know me i'm not in it all that okay i let the information speak for itself uh we use a lot of books and, and and um things like that in the class you don't have to buy any of these books there's a ton of articles that uh, i use so there are a lot of free resources you can use also um this is one that this is one of the things i refer to in the class this study by the southern poverty law center and where is it Hold on, I have a bunch of books next to me. Uh, Teaching Hard History, American Slavery by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Teaching Hard History, American Slavery. Uh, I taught a class yesterday in class the day before. I don't know where my stuff is. Hold on. We got this. Uh, I'll show you a couple books in the class. In Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade. This is one of the books we use. Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust, Slavery and the Rise of European Capitalism by Dr. John Henry Clark. If I go through this stuff, I'll find the other, the, I'll find what I'm looking for. These are two books we use in uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, and Black Star, the African Presence in Early Europe uh, from my friend, uh, Renoko Rashidi, we know Renoko just passed away August 2nd, 2021. He was doing a tour in Egypt. And uh, I've interviewed Renoko a number of times. Renoko just passed away. Um, in From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968, this is one of the books we use. You don't have to buy any of these books. I just use them as reference. If you have them on your shelf, you can take them off, dust them off, what have you. Uh, Martin Malcolm in America, a dream or a nightmare by James H. Cone. This deals with this documents how the ideologies between Dr. King and Malcolm X were converging toward the end of both of their lives. Their ideologies were converging toward the end of both of their lives. So we have that. We've got. Um, I use this in both classes, both classes before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. OK, excellent book. This is the sixth edition. It's falling apart. I use this in both classes. Um, also, African People in World History by Dr. John Herrick Clark, African People in World History. We use this in uh, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade. 
also in understanding the transatlantic slave trade i use egypt on the potomac by tony browder which deals with how the layout of washington dc is a copy of ancient kemet ancient egypt we use that also use egypt on the potomac by tony browder Uh, this is another one that we use here, uh, Hidden Truths. Uh, this is by the Banneker City, Banneker City Cultural Circle. It's a resource guide to the documentary Hidden Colors 2. Fantastic book, Hidden Truths. Um, it's really a study guide for it because it goes through in everything they talk about in Hidden Colors 2, dealing with history, uh, all the references they make. They have a, a short write-up on it here. And... They explain what it is, and then they have other resources for you to do more research. Okay, so uh, for example, they talk about um, uh, let's just pick anything. Uh, let's see here. They talk about uh, did the Dogon descend from the six uh, Nile Valley migration? Okay, this is on page twenty six. Then they go through and explain the Dogon. They reference Dr. Charles Finch. Um, give uh, more more resource more resources. Uh, Page 32, is there any evidence of an African influence in pyramids found in China and Japan? All right. So they go through and reference Dr. Shank out the joke uh, and go through, break this down. OK, so this is a good resource. So this parts in here that we use and the study I'm trying to find. Oh, is this it? No, that's not it. Oh, here it is. I was going through putting stuff together, putting content together, um, just putting things together in my binders for my classes. And uh, so this is um, one that we use here, Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. You can download this right now, and every school in the country should use this, Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. This is from the Southern Poverty Law Center. This study documents how the history of slavery is being incorrectly taught in schools all across the country. They did a survey of 1,000 high school students and 1,700 social studies teachers. Uh, and it goes through and documents how the history of slavery is being incorrectly taught in schools all across the country. And it makes numerous recommendations on how to more correctly teach uh, th that history, okay? Teaching Hard History of American Slavery is at the Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLcenter.org. Uh, Let's see if we have it here. I have it in one of my other presentations here. We'll pull this up on the screen so it's easier to see it. You can download this study. It's like a 56 page study. Share this with your teachers and uh, your children's schools and um, uh, principals, things like this. School board, anybody here on a school board, this is a resource that you all can use. Um, And one of the things they tell you don't do is don't do slave reenactments in class. One of the things they tell you don't do is don't do slave reenactments because it traumatizes students. For one reason, it traumatizes students. Uh, let me pull this up here. Yeah, teaching hard history, American slavery. And I first found out about this study in 2018, February, February 1st, 2018, first day of African American History Month. That's how I found out about this study. There was an article from theatlantic.com. This is one of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries. Uh, Dr. J teaches us, whoever controls the images controls your self-esteem, self-respect, and self-development. Whoever controls the history controls the vision. Okay. And when Dr. Leonard Jeffries and Professor Jane Small teach, Professor Jane Small is another one of my teachers. So many of you have heard the numerous interviews I've done with them. They talk about the pyramid principle. This is the pyramid of Khafre at Giza. The foundation of, the, of a pyramid, uh, the, uh, our foundation is African history and culture. 
This gives us our values, our interests, and our principles. This gives us our VIPs, our values, our interests, and our principles. This gives us a cultural paradigm that we see reality through. The other two sides of the pyramid are economic empowerment and political empowerment. We have to have a synthesis of all of this. It's not just speaking metal netter and playing a djembe and wearing African garb. We have to have African history and culture, but we also have to have economic empowerment and political empowerment. We have to date. We need all three. It's not just one. We need all three. It's not just we're just going to do economic empowerment and and have businesses, but we still have a white colonized mind and we're using white business principles in the African-American community. Because when we study the co-ops, the cooperatives, these were African principles that we use. Those are principles we brought with us from West Africa, largely from West Africa. And we were using them in our communities and they were successful. This is why we were being attacked. This is why the co-ops were being attacked. Okay, now there's a, do I have the rest of that? Okay, this right here. Um, what are kids really learning about slavery? This is what I was looking for. What are kids really learning about slavery? This was an article from uh, the Atlantic.com, February 1st, 2018, that talked about this study, Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. This is how I found out about it. And I put this in my presentations and I teach from the study some also. And they did a survey of 1,000 high school seniors and to find out what they knew about slavery. And they found out only 8% of them could identify slavery as the central cause of the Civil War. Only 8% of high school seniors, 12th graders. 32% uh, 32% uh, only 32% can name the 13th Amendment as the formal end of, of slavery in the U.S. 35% thought, thought it was the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863, that did not free the enslaved Africans. And less than 40 uh, and only 46 percent could identify the middle passage as the transport of enslaved Africans across the Atlantic Ocean to North America. All right. Now, the. The person who headed up the. Uh, advisory panel that put this together is Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries. Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries is uh, a nephew to Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries is an associate professor of history at Ohio State University. Now, I've interviewed him before here on, on our show, on the African History Network show, okay? That's Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries. Uh, so check this out, teaching, you can read this article, What Are Kids Really Learning About Slavery? And uh, check out uh, Teaching Hard History, uh, American Slavery from uh, splcenter.org, Southern Poverty Law Center, splcenter.org. And I, I took the study, I, I took it to a printer, got it printed up. And when you look at it, page six, they have a, a it's a column here from uh, Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries. Okay. And it's a write up from him in here on page six, the preface, page six and seven by Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries. That's a bad brother right there. All right. So, look, we're going to get out of here. Um, hopefully, hopefully you learned something today. Hopefully you enjoy this. Um, register for our courses and um, look out for the African History Network show Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight. Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have the information on our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating empowering and inspiring people of african descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior it's not over till we win wakanda forever um we'll talk to you tomorrow peace thanks for tuning in